This is lecture four in intro organic chemistry. I'm going to look at the acid base mechanism. Now you may think that's not a very important topic in organic chemistry, but it really is. If you understand an acid base mechanism, you pretty much understand the core of organic chemistry mechanism. So take some time with this. So let's start with definitions of Lewis acids and bases. Now a Lewis acid is a substance that accepts a pair of electrons in forming a bond. And we have a symbol for that. A broad symbol is an electrophile. Electron lover is what it means. If it's an electron acceptor, then it's an electron lover or electrophile. The symbol we use is E+. plus. doesn't have to be positively charged to be an electrophile, but the symbol is E+. Plus. A Lewis base is an electron pair donor and the term we use for that is a nucleophile short for a nucleus lover now why a nucleus well remember a nucleus is positively charged because of the protons so a nucleus lover is an electron pair donor an electron pair donor would donate to something that's positive the term seems a bit uh, out of place to me but that's what's used and the symbol for it is NU with a non-bonded pair of electrons and a negative charge. Now a nucleophile does not have to have a non-bonded pair of electrons, nor does it have to be negative, but that is a symbol that's used. In fact, many nucleophiles do have these characteristics. In any case, as a result of a Lewis base reacting with Lewis acid, the base donates a pair of electrons to the acid and a bond is formed. Let's spend a few minutes and look at what makes a Lewis acid an electron pair acceptor. To accept electrons, a Lewis acid must have a vacant low energy orbital that can accept the electrons, or a polar bond to hydrogen such that H plus can be lost and the H plus would accept the electrons. I'll develop this further as we discuss it. So Lewis acids include many metal cations. That would be polyvalent metal cations. Aluminum plus three, iron plus three in particular, although iron two is also a Lewis acid. Zinc plus two. Why is that? Well because they have empty orbitals that can accept pairs of electrons and they'll form a bond to a base. The group 3A elements such as BF3, boron and BF3, aluminum and AlCl3, recall that these are subvalent. They have an empty 2pz orbital, so they can accept a pair of electrons. In that sense, they are Lewis acids or electron pair acceptors. Many transition metal salts, titanium tetrachloride, ferric chloride, zinc chloride, stannic chloride, they're all Lewis acids, and that, some of them are quite acidic, in fact, because of the high positive charge on the metal. So in solution, the chlorides would leave, and the metal cation can be an electron pair acceptor from water and, for example, even from bases like hydroxide. We need to look very closely at the acid-base mechanism. So we're saying that a Lewis base is an electron donor. It transfers a pair of electrons to a Lewis acid. Look at this simple reaction. Water is amphoteric. It can act as a base in the presence of an acid. So we draw an arrow from the electron donor to the electron acceptor. We draw the arrow specifically from the electrons that are being donated. It's the non-bonded electrons. Now these pairs are identicals. It doesn't matter which one you start at, but start at one or the other. Don't bring the arrow from the bond here. That is not the pair of electrons that's being donated. It's one of the non-bonded pairs of electrons in water that's being donated to form the bond to the hydrogen in HCl. And draw the arrow directly to the hydrogen. Don't draw it to the bond because the pair of electrons is not being donated to the bond, nor is it being donated to chloride. It's being donated to the hydrogen. It's really important that you get the direction right. So start the arrow from the donor and finish the arrow head at the acceptor. Think of passing a football. A football quarterback passes the football to a receiver. You're drawing the direction of the movement of the football. Don't get it backwards. 
Notice also there's a second arrow here. Why is that? Hydrogen is in the first period. It can have a maximum of two electrons around it. If it's going to accept a pair of electrons from water to form a covalent bond to the oxygen, it can no longer have room for or have place for the pair of electrons it's sharing with the chlorine. And so chlorine takes with it the pair of electrons. It's a leaving group. It leaves with the pair of electrons that it was sharing. Notice it forms chloride, which has eight electrons in the valence shell that it owns and doesn't share. Look at what happens to water. This non-bonded pair of electrons becomes this shared pair. The oxygen, which formerly owned one, two, four, six electrons, it was neutral, now it owns two, three, four, five. The oxygen only owns five electrons. It's an oxonium cation. This, my friends, is the acid-base mechanism that you need to pay close attention to. Let's take a look at some Lewis acids. These are electron pair acceptors. They may or may not be proton donors. Some of them are, some of them are not. So strong acids like hydronium, hydrochloric, hydrobromic, nitric, sulfuric, these are protic acids. They contain hydrogen, polar covalently bonded to some non-metal. And so the hydrogen does not have an empty orbital, but it can form one when it leaves the chloride or the bromide or the nitrate and so on. Acetic acid and ethanol and phenol. These have hydrogen polar covalently bonded to an electronegative atom. And so when the hydrogen leaves as H+, the oxygen, in this case, accepts the pair of electrons. Now, carboxylic acids have a pKa of around 5. So they're moderately strong acids. Ethanol is like water, pretty much neutral. Its pKa is around 16. Phenol is a weak acid with a pKa of around 10. In every case, the hydrogen is polar covalently bonded to a nonmetal, and that bond can break. The electrons that were shared with the hydrogen remain behind, and then H plus leaves, and that's the electron accepting part. We'll also see that cations like chloronium and bromonium can be acidic. They're electron pair acceptors. And we already mentioned the subvalent group 3A elements, aluminum and boron, and then the transition metals of some high charge. All examples of species that can accept electron pairs and therefore are, in fact, Lewis acids. Let's look at some Lewis bases. Recall Lewis bases are electron pair donors. So they will have non-bonding electron pairs that can be donated to Lewis acids. Now, some Lewis bases don't have non-bonded pairs. I'll speak to that in a minute. But let's look at some examples of bases that have non-bonded pairs. The oxygen in alcohols. The oxygen in ethers has non-bonded pairs of electrons. The oxygens in aldehydes and ketones, acid chlorides, carboxylic acids. Can a carboxylic acid really be a base? Sure not a very strong base. Remember carboxylic acids have a pK of about 5? Well they're also a base if you combine them with a really strong acid like conch sulfuric acid you can get a hydrogen ion protonating one of these positions and the pKb is around 20 give or take. Esters similar to acids. Amides pretty neutral. pKa is around 16. Now amines they are significantly more basic. The pKb is around 4. The sulfur can be an electron donor, a Lewis base, and of course the oxygen and water. Some compounds can act as both a Lewis acid and a Lewis base, like for example water. It's amphoteric. So the hydrogen can be an electron pair acceptor. The oxygen can be electron pair donor. In such cases, usually they're not particularly good at either, but they can do both. You'll see that uh, some Lewis bases, like carboxylic acids and esters and amides, you see them here and here, they have more than one atom having non-bonded pairs of electrons they can donate. So they could be protonated at one of several sites, and we'll learn about this later. There are examples of Lewis bases that do not have non-bonded pairs. I'll take, for example, magnesium hydride. The bond between magnesium and hydrogen is not ionic, but it's very polar covalent. 
and in the presence of an acid these bonds would break producing strong bases like hydride and magnesium plus two cation. So here's an example of a, a Lewis base, a very powerful Lewis base that doesn't actually have non-bonded pairs of electrons but it will form them as these polar bonds break. On page 26 we'll look at the mechanism of a couple acid-base reactions. We'll start with sulfuric acid be neutralized by potassium hydroxide. Sulfuric acid is diprotic. Removal of the first hydrogen, it's a pretty strong acid, pKa1-3, and then the removal of the second hydrogen would be plus 1.9, so still reasonably strong. So we draw an arrow from hydroxide, the electron donor or the Lewis base, to the hydrogen of the acid. And we're saying this pair of electrons here is going to bond to the hydrogen. After it bonds to the hydrogen, here it is here being shared. It started as a non-bonded pair and now it's a shared pair. What's the fate of this pair of electrons? They can't stay bonded to hydrogen because hydrogen is a first period element. It doesn't have room for any more. So we draw a second arrow showing that the pair of electrons that were shared will now be owned by the oxygen. So this shared pair of electrons is now this unshared pair of electrons in potassium bisulfate. Notice the potassium ion is not covalently bonded to oxygen. There is no line here. It's an ionic bond and similarly over here potassium is ionically bonded to the oxygen. The second step is the same as the first. Here again we have another molecule of potassium hydroxide with a non-bonded pair of electrons. The Lewis base donates the pair of electrons to the acidic hydrogen which is electron acceptor or Lewis acid. That pair of electrons is here. It's being shared now by the hydrogen from the acid with the hydroxide from the base in neutral water. And the second arrow here shows the movement of the shared pair of electrons between the oxygen and hydrogen in the acid to become the non-bonded pair of electrons in the product. So here this pair of electrons becomes this non-bonded pair here. One more example here. We have sodium carbonate. It's a moderately strong base. PKB1 is 3.7 and then bicarbonate over here, sodium bicarbonate in the middle, PKB2, 7.6. Our base, the oxygen in carbonate, Lewis base, electron pair donor to the acidic hydrogen in hydronium ion. Here's our non bonded pair of electrons where it's not being shared, and here now it's being shared to the hydrogen. Then the second arrow shows the movement of the shared pair of electrons to the oxygen in hydronium ion. Notice how you draw the arrow right from the bond. Don't draw it from the hydrogen. Show exactly where it's coming from. It's this pair of electrons, the shared pair, that's going to become the non-shared pair. Here's the shared pair. Here's the non-shared pair. The reaction simply repeats itself because it's a dibasic base. Here we have another base, sodium bicarbonate. The oxygen is the Lewis base, the electron donor to the hydrogen. Here's my unshared pair, and here's the shared pair. And the second arrow shows the movement of the shared pair of electrons in hydronium to become the non-bonded electron pair. So this shared pair becoming the non-bonded pair of electrons. When you're drawing Lewis acids, it's helpful to remember that all the acidic hydrogens are bonded to oxygens and all the oxygens to the central nonmetal. If you keep that in mind, it's really simple to draw oxyacids. On page 27, we will look at the Bronsted Lawry theory of acids and bases. A Bronsted acid is a hydrogen ion donor or a proton donor.
you appreciate that a hydrogen ion is a proton. This will be a hydrogen atom. It's one proton and one electron. And if we could separate the electron from the proton, we'd have one electron and one proton. And a proton, therefore, you see, is the same as a hydrogen ion. It's just easier to say a proton donor than a hydrogen ion donor. A Bronsted base is a proton acceptor. And so neutralization is defined as the transfer of a proton from the proton donor, from an acid, to a proton acceptor, that is a base. So consider, for example, hydrogen chloride gas, that's a proton donor, reacting with ammonia gas, which is a base. The proton is transferred from the HCl to the ammonia producing ammonium ion and chloride anion, which deposits in air as solid ammonium chloride. Here's an organic example. Acetylene, welder's fuel, has a hydrogen attached to a triply bonded carbon. This is called a terminal alkyne. Terminal alkynes have a hydrogen that's unusually acidic for a hydrocarbon, whereas something like methane has a pKa of around 54, acetylene has a pKa of about 25, which is still weak but surprisingly acidic. It's acidic enough it could be removed by a very strong base like sodium amide. So when acetylene reacts with sodium amide, a proton is transferred from acetylene, the proton donor, to amide ion, the proton acceptor, forming ammonia and sodium acetylide. Now conjugate acid-base pairs are therefore defined as species that differ by a proton. One more example. Sodium hydroxide is a base reacting with acetic acid. So when hydroxide base accepts a proton, it forms water, and water is said to be the conjugate acid of the hydroxide base. They differ by a hydrogen ion. Similarly, acetic acid is an acid. When it reacts, it loses a hydrogen ion. What's formed is acetate ion, and acetate anion is the conjugate base of acetic acid. So in every acid-base reaction, we can identify a conjugate acid-base pair. And the word conjugate simply means related. So acetic acid is very much like acetate. They differ only by a hydrogen ion. We want to look at the strengths of acids and bases and then talk about their reactivity. So a very strong acid like HCl, it must have a very weak conjugate base, chloride. You see, if the acid HCl releases a proton readily, then chloride, well, it would not attract or hold a proton very strongly. Because if it did, HCl would not be able to release it readily, and therefore HCl would not be a strong acid. Likewise, a very strong base hydroxide has a very weak conjugate acid, water. If the base hydroxide accepts a proton readily, its conjugate acid, water, would not be readily giving it up. It would not be a strong acid if hydroxide is to be a strong base. There's an important relationship between the pKa of any acid and the pKb of its conjugate base. They add to be equal to 14. And this is true in water. If you had a different solvent, that number would be a different number. But in water, pKa and pKb of any conjugate acid-base pair is 14. This is quite useful. If, for example, we looked at acetic acid, it has a pKa of 4.7. Well, then we can easily calculate the pKb of its conjugate base as 14 minus the pKa, and we can determine that it's 9.3. We often want to refer to an acid or a base as being very strong or somewhat strong or weak. We can assign these terms to a range of pK values. For example, an acid with a pKa of less than 1 is described as being a strong acid.
such as sulfuric acid with a pKa of negative 3. That's a strong acid. If the pKa falls between 1 and 5, we would describe that as being a moderately strong acid. For example, phosphoric acid, its pKa is 2.1. If the pKa falls between 5 and 15, that would be described as being a weak acid. For example, carbonic acid, pKa is 6.4. If an acid has a pKa of greater than 15, it would be described as a very weak acid, such as water with a pKa of 15.74. Those same pKa values apply to bases. A base with a pKb of less than 1 is described as being a strong base, such as sodium hydroxide with a pKb of minus 1.74. Bases with a pKb between 1 and 5 are moderately strong, such as sodium phosphate with a pKb of 1.7. Bases with a pKb between 5 and 15 are weak bases, such as sodium bicarbonate. pKb is 7.6. That's baking soda. And with a pKb of greater than 15, we would describe such a base as being very weak, again like water with a pKb of 15.74. Notice that water has a pKa equal to its pKb, so it's equally strong as an acid or a base. Hydronium ion is the strongest acid that can exist in water, and any stronger acid will be leveled or reduced in strength to a pKa of minus 1.74, which is the pKa of hydronium ion, by water. And therefore, water is said to be a leveling solvent. So consider, for example, the reaction of hydrogen chloride gas and water. Hydrogen chloride is a very strong acid. Its pKa is negative 7. When it donates a proton, what's left is chloride and hydronium ion. And that reaction essentially goes to completion. And so, after adding hydrogen chloride to water, there really is no hydrogen chloride left. It's all hydronium chloride. So that bottle of acid that we call hydrochloric acid, technically that's not true. It's actually hydronium chloride. Hydronium is the strongest acid that can exist in water. Similarly, hydroxide is the strongest base that it can exist in water. And any stronger base will be leveled or reduced in strength to a pKb of minus 1.74, that's the pKb of hydroxide ion, by the solvent water. So consider sodium amide, a really strong base, pKb is minus 21. If that is put in water, it reacts completely with water, forming ammonia and sodium hydroxide. And sodium hydroxide is the only base present in water when we add sodium amide. Any base that is stronger than hydroxide will react with water to produce only hydroxide. And therefore, water is said to be a leveling solvent. Page 28. Predicting the extent of an acid-base reaction. Look at a familiar example. Acetic acid, moderately strong acid, pKa 4.7, reacting with sodium hydroxide, a strong base, pKb minus 1.74, producing water and sodium acetate. To what extent do you think that reaction would proceed? It would be reasonable to say that it probably exceeds pretty much to completion because you're reacting with such a strong base. Here's some general statements I want you to think about before we get into the arithmetic here. In general, an acid and a base will spontaneously react only if the reaction products are a weaker acid and a weaker base than the reagent acid and the reagent base. So in our example, the reagent acid is acetic acid, pKa 4.7. The product acid is water, 15.74. That's a much weaker acid. The reagent base is sodium hydroxide, a strong base. The product base is sodium acetate, a weak base. So this makes sense. Now consider this statement. A stronger acid will donate a proton to a base whose conjugate acid is weaker. Okay, so a stronger acid, 
in this case acetic acid 4.7, will donate a hydrogen ion to a base hydroxide whose conjugate acid is weaker. Well, the conjugate acid of hydroxide is water, and yes, it's weaker than acetic acid, so I guess that makes sense. Try this statement. An acid with a lower pKa, 4.7, will donate a proton to a base, this is hydroxide, whose conjugate acid has a higher pKa. So notice the conjugate acid, water, the conjugate acid of hydroxide is water. It has a higher pKa than acetic acids. That all makes sense. I don't find it particularly useful except in the broadest sense. Surely we can do better than that. Take a look at page 33 with me. On page 33 I have listed pKa and pKb values of many acids and bases. Some of these are fairly exact values. Some are estimates for those extreme acids and extreme bases. But it's a pretty good reference. Now since we know the strength of various acids and the strengths of various bases, should we not be able to somehow combine these pK values together and get a better estimate of how far to what extent an acid-base reaction will occur? And the answer is yes we can, so let's go take a look at that. So the extent of an acid-base reaction can be calculated, at least approximately, if we know the strength of the acid, its pKa, and the strength of the base, its pKb. It can be shown that the pKeq of an acid-base reaction is equal to the pKa of the acid reacting and the pKb of the base that reacts minus 14, which is pKw. Let's consider a familiar example, acetic acid reacting with ammonia. Acetic acid is a moderately strong acid. Its pKa is 4.7. Ammonia is a moderately strong base, pKb 4.8. Do you think these will react to completion? To what extent would you think? Well, maybe not to completion because neither of them is strong, but it should react to some extent. So we'll use our formula here. pKeq is equal to the pKa of the acid which is 4.7, plus the pKb of the base, which is 4.8, minus 14, gives us negative 4.5. We want to calculate KEQ from pKeq in the same way that hydrogen ion is calculated as the anti-log of negative pH. Similarly, KEQ can be calculated as the anti-log of the negative pKeq. So in this example, 10 to the minus negative 4.5 is 10 to the plus 4.5, which is 3163. It's a pretty big number. What's it mean? Well, remember what KEQ is. It's the arithmetic product of the molar ratio of the products to the reactants. Now, I realize that these terms will be raised to the power of the coefficients in the balanced equation, but in acid-base reactions we consider always one step at a time, so the coefficients are always one and the power is always one, so we don't have to deal with that. So in this example, KEQ is the molar concentration of the products, their product, divided by molar concentration of the reactants. That's equal to 3163 over 1. It's a ratio, which means that the reaction goes pretty far. There's a lot more product than there is reactant at the end of reaction. Before we calculate more of these, I want to go further into what this actually means. Let's take KEQ and convert that into percent extent of a reaction. To what percent does this reaction go? Page 29, approximating the percent extent of an acid-base reaction using KEQ. Now think about this with me. The KEQ expression is the concentration of products at the end of a reaction divided by the concentration reactants at the end of a reaction or at equilibrium. The percent extent of a reaction is the concentration of products at the end of a reaction divided by the concentration of reactants that you start with, not at the end, but what you start with, times 100%. Now I will make this clear to you in the example that follows.
So consider this generic example. A student has five exams to write in exam week, one each morning, Monday, Tuesday morning, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday morning. Now by Wednesday afternoon, the student will have completed three of his five exams here, but two exams remain unwritten. The extent of reaction or extent of completion would be the product divided by the reactant initially present. We could say that three exams were completed. We had five exams to start. And so the ratio three-fifths is 0 0.6. We can say that we are 60% completed our exams by Wednesday afternoon. Three exams completed. They're the product. Five exams initial. There they are the concentration of reactant at the beginning of the reaction. Now compare the same situation and calculate KEQ. KEQ is the products divided by the reactants at the end of the reaction. So by Wednesday afternoon we have three exams completed. The reactant remaining is two exams remaining. Three over two is 1.5. And any number can be written as a ratio over one. So basically we're saying we have completed 1.5 times as much as what remains. Three exams completed are the product. Two exams remaining are the amount of reaction at the end of the reaction at equilibrium. So if someone told you that they had three exams completed but still had two exams remaining, you could calculate the number of exams initially, couldn't you? By adding, well, I completed three exams. I have two remaining. I must have had five initially. So note that the KEQ numerator, three, here it is, the KEQ numerator is three. That's the number of exams completed plus the KEQ denominator of two. Here it is, the KEQ denominator is the number of exams remaining. Three plus two is five, and that's the extent of reaction denominator. Up here, the extent of reaction denominator is five. Remember, the denominator is the number of exams initially. So, when we know the KEQ, and we will because we'll have PK values from acids and bases, we want to then convert that to calculate percent extent of a reaction. We could write the value we get from KEQ divided by 1, and then remember that the extent of reaction will be the product, 1.5, divided by initially, what's initially present? Well, that would be 1.5 plus 1. That's the amount completed, the amount completed, plus the amount remaining. Together that gives me the amount initially present. The ratio is 1.5 over 2.5 or 3 fifths or 60 percent as we showed previously. Pretty neat. Page 30. In the previous generic example about exams, we had one reactant that would be the uncompleted exams, and it underwent a single reaction to a single product, completed exams. In a real acid-base reaction, there's actually two reactants, acid and base, and two products formed, conjugate base and conjugate acid. We want to estimate the extent of the acid or the extent of the base reaction. They'll be the same, and so the root of KEQ will give us this, rather than KEQ. Let's digress for a second to an example from analytical chemistry. You're probably familiar with writing ice tables. Consider the acid-base reaction involving one molar ammonia, weak acid, pKa is 9.2, with a weak base, one molar bicarbonate, pKb is 7.6. Let's calculate pKEQ. It's pKa 9.2 for the acid, plus pKb, 7.6 for the base, minus pKw, minus 14. We get plus 2.8. And so KEQ is 10 to the minus pKEQ, which is 10 to the minus 2.8, or 0 0.0016. In an ice table, we have the initial concentrations. They're each one molar of the reactants, and we don't have any products initially. We don't know how much of these two react, 
but we'll just say it's x and they'll be equal quantities and they will produce x quantity of ammonia and carbonic acid products. So at the end of the reaction at equilibrium the remaining reactant will be 1 minus x for the ammonium and 1 minus x for the bicarbonate and the product will be x concentration for both the ammonia and the carbonic acid. The equilibrium expression is the molar concentration of the products divided by the molar concentration of the reactants remaining at the end of the reaction. That'll be x times x over 1 minus x times 1 minus x. And our number here that we calculated up here, 0016. And we'll write that as a ratio over 1. Now for any reaction where the stoichiometric coefficients of the reactants are the same, and they will be in an acid-base reaction, they're always one and one, then the amount of either product as a ratio of its initial reactant will give us the extent of reaction. So we could either calculate the concentration of ammonia product divided by ammonium ion initially present, or we could calculate the amount of carbonic acid product divided by the amount of bicarbonate initially present. Either of these is a, the extent of reaction. So we want the root of KEQ rather than KEQ. X over 1 minus X It's the product at equilibrium divided by reactant remaining, which is the square root of 0016 or 0 0.04. And we can write that as a ratio over 1. That'll be the root of KEQ. So now the extent of reaction is the product divided by the reactant that's initially present. And that'll be the product divided by the product plus the reactant remaining. These two terms tell me the amount of reactant initially present. So that'll be O4 is the amount of product divided by O4 plus 1 will give me the amount of reactant initially present. The ratio is O38 multiplied by 100, and the extent of reaction is 3.8%. It's small, not surprising, considering that the acid and the base are both weak. You can prove this using the quadratic formula, and I have it here, but I won't read it to you. To summarize, estimate the percent extent of an acid-base reaction in water as follows. Use the acid and base strengths, the pKa and pKb. Estimate pKeq. Convert this to KeQ. You want the square root of KEQ to calculate the extent of reaction. Convert this to a percent. When you do this, keep in mind that the calculated values are only estimates. We assume equal concentrations of both acid and base. When you're in analytical chemistry class, be sure to use exact concentrations in your calculations. In the pages that follow, I have three worked examples of calculating percent extent of reaction. Then I have a table of various acids and bases, and I'm asking you to estimate the percent extent of reaction and check your answers against those posted on Blackboard. On page 31, there are three worked examples for you to look at, and on page 32, there's a table with an exercise with five examples for you to work out. I've got the first one already completed. I'll do the second one with you now, and I'll leave the rest for you to do and compare the results on Blackboard. So in the second equation here, we have hydrogen cyanide reacting with ammonia. Let's write the equation, and we'll calculate the extent of reaction. You're going to look up the pK values. They're listed on the next page. I want to point this rule of thumb out just now. We say that a reaction goes to completion when the square root of pKeq is less than negative 3, which translates to KeQ is a million to 1 or greater. Does that make sense? If you have a million times more product than reactants, that's said to go to completion. A reaction is said not to have occurred when the square root of pKeq is greater than or equal to plus 3, which translates to a KEQ of less than or equal to 1 over a million. So if the ratio of products to reactants is less than 1 over a million, well, that reaction really didn't occur.
That's a rule of thumb, but we can calculate, or at least estimate, the percent extent of reaction, and we'll do that now. So consider then hydrogen cyanide plus ammonia. That'd be HCN plus NH3. Hydrogen cyanide is a proton donor. Ammonia is the proton acceptor. That'll produce ammonium plus cyanide. What's the percent extent of that reaction? Easy. Get the pK values from the table on the next page. For HCN, its pKa is 9.3. And for ammonia, its pKb is 4.8. So pKa plus pKb is 14.1. We'll then subtract pKw, 14, and so pKeq is 0 0.1. Keq is equal to 10 to the minus pKeq. That would be 10 to the minus 0 0.1. And that number is 0 0.79. Now, to calculate percent extent of reaction, we want the square root of KEQ. So the square root of KEQ, 0.79, is equal to 0 0.89. And we'll write that as a number over 1. So let's remind ourselves what this is. This is the numerator, is the concentration of products at the end of a reaction divided by the denominator, which is the concentration of reactants remaining at the end of the reaction. To calculate extent of reaction, we want concentration of products produced divided by initial concentration of reactants. Well, this isn't initial, but we can get the initial if we take what's left at the end of the reaction and add it to the products, because they came from reactant. We add those together as follows. Percent extent of reaction is 0 0.89. Concentration of product at the end of reaction divided by concentration initially present, which is the product formed plus 1, which is the reactant remaining. The sum of those two is the re reactant initially present times 100 percent. That works out to be about 47 percent. Remember it's an estimate. And it kind of makes sense. We have reactants that are moderately strong base and a weak acid. So 47 percent seems believable. Again, I'll leave the rest for you to do and compare the answers on Blackboard. Page 35, Factors Affecting Acidity. Let's look at the acidity trends in some oxy acids, and then we'll draw some conclusions. We'll start over here on the right-hand side of the table. I have the halic acids, iodic, bromic, and chloric, and I have their structures drawn below here. Notice that iodic acid is a strong acid. Its pKa is 0.8. Bromic acid a little bit stronger, pKa negative 0.5, and chloric acid stronger still, its pKa is negative 1. Look at the hypohalous acids here. I have hypoiotis, hypobromus, hypochlorous. Now we won't really discuss hypofluorous. It's anomalous to other oxy acids because it's the only case where a halogen is more electronegative than the oxygen, so it behaves quite differently. Here are the structures of hypoiotis, hypobromous, hypochlorous. Notice that hypoiotis acid is a weak acid with a pKa of 10.6. Hypobromous acid is still weak, but it's not as weak. pKa is 8.7, and hypochlorous is a little stronger, still 7.5. So there clearly is a trend we're seeing. If I write the electronegativity values for the halogens, we can discuss what's going on. So the electronegativity 
of iodine is 2.5, bromine 2.8, and chlorine 3.0. So look at the structures and think about this. All else being equal, the more electronegative the halogen, the stronger is the oxy acid. Chlorine is more electronegative than bromine or iodine. Hypochlorous acid is the strongest acid in the group. So why is that? Well, think about what happens when an oxy acid loses a hydrogen ion. The negative charge will form on the oxygen. Now, a negative charge on oxygen is more reactive or less stable or in a higher energy state than if it were neutral. Having an electronegative halogen like chlorine will share or take some of the negative charge from the oxygen giving the conjugate base, the anion, a little more stability than it otherwise would have if the chlorine didn't share some. So the more electronegative the halogen is next to the oxygen, and I can apply this to any non-metal, sulfur and phosphorus, it's still true, the more electronegative that atom is, the better able it is to share electron density with the negatively charged conjugate base and therefore stabilize the conjugate base. And so if the base is more stable, that would mean the acid is more reactive. Make sense? Compare the acidity of the hydrogen halides here on the left. Hydrofluoric acid is a moderately strong acid. Its pKa is 3.2. Hydrogen chloride is a lot stronger. Its pKa is negative 7. Hydrogen bromide is 10 times stronger still with a pKa of negative 8. And hydrogen iodide 10 times stronger still with a pKa of negative 9. Based on the electronegativity of the halogens, this is exactly the opposite trend that we saw with the oxy acids on the right. So what's going on? Well, with the oxy acids on the right, it was the oxygen that had the negative charge in the conjugate base when the acid lost the hydrogen ion. And it was always the same atom, an oxygen atom. But here, the negative charge will be on different atoms, fluoride, chloride, bromide, or iodide. So what's the difference? Let me write down the period number and the number of electrons that each of these halogens has. So fluorine's in the second period. It has nine electrons when it's neutral. Chlorine is in the third period with 17 electrons. Bromine is in the fourth period with 35 electrons when it's neutral. And iodine is in the fifth period with 53 electrons when it's neutral. So say, for example, when iodine gains an additional electron, and it will when hydrogen iodide loses a proton, it'll then iodide has 54 electrons instead of 53. What percentage difference is that in electric charge? Well, it's about 1 in 50, or 2%. So it's about a 2% increase in electric charge. In the case of hydrogen bromide, when it loses a proton, bromine with 35 electrons becomes bromide with 36. That's roughly one extra electron in 33. That's about a 3% increase in negative charge. In the case of chlorine, when HCl loses a proton, chlorine with 17 electrons becomes chloride with 18. What percent increase in negative charge is that? Well, it's roughly 1 in 20, or about 5% increase in electric charge. And in the case of fluorine, when HF loses a, a proton, fluorine with 9 electrons becomes fluoride with 10, and that's one part in 10, so it's about a 10% increase in electric charge. And electric charge, again, represents a high energy state. And so it's simply a case of size of the atom that's bearing the negative charge. All else being equal, a larger atom can stabilize a negative charge better than a small atom with fewer electrons. And this effect of size overrides the effect of electronegativity. Both are true, but don't necessarily work together.
Continuing on page 35, we're looking at trends in acidity. Notice here we have a carboxylic acid. This is an organic acid. This one has four carbons. We'll number these carbons one, two, three, and four. Now you're probably familiar with acetic acid. It's a two carbon carboxylic acid. This four carbon carboxylic acid named 4-chlorobutanoic acid. Notice that as this chlorine moves closer and closer to the carboxylic acid, the acidity of the acid is increasing. So why is that? Same rationale as we used before. When the carboxylic acid deprotonates, the oxygen will have a negative charge and the electronegative chlorine can help to share or stabilize the negative charge and the closer it is the better it is able to do so if the conjugate base is more stable or less reactive then the carboxylic acid is more acidic take a look at the oxy acids of chlorine pretty dramatic trend here hypochlorous acid has a pKa of 7.6, it's weak acid. Add one more oxygen, and we get chlorous acid with a pKa of 2. That's almost, almost 6 powers of 10, almost a million times more acidic simply by the addition of one oxygen. Going from chlorous acid to chloric acid, one more oxygen still, the pKa drops another three powers of ten, so chloric acid is a thousand times more acidic than chlorous. At a fourth oxygen, we get perchloric acid, the pKa drops to negative ten. That's nine powers of ten more acidic. That's a billion times more acidic. What is going on? Well, again, it has to be due to the addition of the oxygens. The more electronegative atoms you add to the oxy acid, the better the conjugate base is stabilized by all the oxygens. But this is more than just induction here. There's actually resonance occurring. I've drawn out two of these to illustrate. So here is hypochlorous acid, strong base, sodium hydroxide, the acid base mechanism deprotonates the acid and the pair of electrons stays with the oxygen. That gives us sodium hypochlorite. Now certainly there is some electron withdrawing or sharing from the oxygen to the chlorine because chlorine is electronegative, but there is little in the way of resonance that can occur. Now we could draw a resonance structure here. We could say this pair of electrons becomes a pi bond and if that happens what would that form? This would be the resonance structure. In this structure the chlorine now owns eight electrons so it's negatively charged instead of the oxygen which is now neutral. So perhaps we could argue that there's a bit of resonance occurring but in resonance structures the negative charge is preferentially on the more electronegative atom which is oxygen. So the contribution of resonance is pretty small, if any, in this case. Let's compare that with chlorous acid. Chlorous acid has an additional oxygen. Here's the acid base mechanism. A pair of electrons stay on the conjugate base, which is sodium chloride. Now again, there is some electron withdrawal from the oxygen to the chlorine by induction, but it's relatively small compared to the resonance effect. And here we have the non-bonded pair of electrons becoming a pi bond, and to accommodate this, a pi bond breaks and becomes a non-bonded pair of electrons. So we actually can write two resonance structures with a negative charge is spread out over two different oxygens. And this has a dramatic increase in stabilizing the conjugate base. The more stable the conjugate base is, the stronger is the oxy acid. So we can appreciate the dramatic increase in acidity as we add more and more oxygens to the oxy acid. Page 36. Let's look at the trends in the acidity of the element hydrides across the periodic table. Start here with methane. Now this number is a difference in electronegativity between hydrogen and the nonmetal. 
carbon's two and a half, hydrogen's two point one, the difference is point four. Ammonia is three, hydrogen's two point one, the difference is point nine, and so on. So as the nonmetal becomes more electronegative, the difference in electronegativity will increase. In other words, the bond becomes more polar. So start with methane. Its pKa is about 55-ish. That's about as weak as an acid can be and still be called an acid. As we go from left to right, ammonia, still not very acidic, but dramatically more acidic than methane. pKa is 35. Larger difference in electronegativity, larger electronegativity of the nonmetal. Look at water. Its pKa is about 16. Again, oxygen's more electronegative, and so the bond polarity is greater. There's a greater difference in electronegativity between the two. And hydrogen fluoride is truly acidic now. Its pKa is 3.2. And certainly the difference in electronegativity is quite high. It's almost high enough to be considered an ionic bond. So we can say that as the non-metal becomes more and more electronegative, it's better able to stabilize the negative charge of the conjugate base of these acids, and therefore the acids will be, in fact, stronger acids. And that trend, left to right increase, holds across all the periods that we're looking at here. As we move left to right across any period, the element hydrides become more and more acidic. As we go down the groups, we see that acidity increases going down each group even though the electronegativity of the nonmetal is decreasing but we already considered that size is a bigger influence here take a look at the pkbs of the conjugate bases of the element hydrides so here we have methide is the conjugate base of methane and so if methane is the weakest acid it makes sense that its conjugate base, methide, is the strongest base. pKb of negative 41 is really, really strong. So as we move from left to right across any period, the pKbs of the conjugate bases of the hydrides are decreasing because the pKa of the conjugate acids are increasing. And that trend pretty much holds through left to right across each row. And as we go up any column, we see the basicity is increasing. pKb of 23 for iodide, 22 for bromide, 21 for chloride, 10.8 for fluoride. And that's simply because the acidity is increasing down each group, and therefore the basicity of the conjugate bases must increase up each group. Just a couple more trends to observe here. So let's consider polyprotic acids, that is acids with more than one ionizable hydrogen, like phosphoric acid. pKa1 is 2.1, it's moderately strong. pKa2 is 7.2, that's a weak acid. That is 5 powers of 10 less acidic. It's 100,000 times less acidic than removal of the first hydrogen. Taking away the third hydrogen, the pKa is 12.4. Again, another 5 powers of 10 less acidic. I guess that makes sense if you think about it. To remove hydrogen ion from neutral phosphoric acid has got to be easier than taking away a proton from negatively charged dihydrogen phosphate. And that's got to be easier than taking away another proton from monohydrogen phosphate, which is a charge of minus 2. So that's the true for all oxy acids. The first ionization is always easier than the second, easier than the third. We have already discussed the importance of inductive effects and resonance effects on acidity. Removing or sharing the negative charge of the conjugate base will make the conjugate acid more acidic. Let's compare perchloric acid, sulfuric acid, and phosphoric acid. They all have the same number of oxygens, but chlorine is more electronegative than sulfur which is more electronegative than phosphorus, and therefore perchloric acid is the strongest acid of the group, followed by sulfuric, followed by phosphoric. Here again in the halic acid series, chloric is more acidic than bromic, more acidic than iodic, for the very same reason chlorine is more electronegative than bromine, more than iodine. In this next series we see acetic acid, monofluoroacetic acid, difluoroacetic acid, and trifluoroacetic acid.
the more fluorines that are present, the greater is the acidity because more fluorines will allow for greater charge sharing with the electronegative oxygen in the conjugate base. And we've already discussed how increasing the number of oxygens on an oxy acid will increase the acidity dramatically. And that's probably enough for trends in acidity and basicity.